My name is Vitaly Katsanelson, and this is the Earn and Invest podcast. Over the years, I've changed the way I look at the past. Sure, I've had my share of hardships. My father died when I was seven. I had a learning disability and started elementary school severely behind. I felt the sting and persecution of being a religious outsider in a homogenous community. But as an adult, I have chosen to reframe those experiences. Instead of concentrating on the unfairness or loss, I see a heroic and magical journey that has landed me here into the life I live today. But then it hit me. This reframing should not only apply to my past, but to my present and future. Just like my past, I can't totally control what will happen to me. But I sure can influence one thing, how I think about it. Vitaly Katznelson joined Investment Management Associates, IMA, in 1997 at first as an analyst, then he became a portfolio manager, CIO, and today he's IMA's CEO and its biggest cheerleader. He's the author of several books, including the most recent Soul in the Game, in which he champions the classic Stoic teachings both in life and investing. Vitaly, welcome to Earn and Invest. In your book, Soul in the Game, you say, the Stoics viewed money as an external advantage. The goal, however, is not to acquire as many external advantages as possible, but to use them wisely. Is it me, or does this seem like an unlikely philosophy for a wealth manager? What a great question. So, <laughs> I love how you put it. Well, I think, number one, I think we have to look at this, like, you know, the Epictetus has this concept, the economy of control. And you have things that are internal, things you can control, and things that are external that you can't control. Money would fall, and under internal, there are very few things that fall into it. How you respond to things you can control, okay? How you behave you can control. Almost everything else is external because it's not up to you. And therefore, money would fall into something that is external because you can work very hard to make money, but you still may not be able to make a lot of money, okay? So the, I would argue you want to focus on the process, not as much on the outcome, you know, and not necessarily set goals where you say, I need to have this much money in my bank account by this date. And there are many other reasons why not to do this. But one of the reasons is that, to answer your question, is that when you don't arrive to this goal, you won't, you know, you are not going to be crushed. But also another reason is when you arrive to this goal, then a lot of people just set a new goal that is larger <laughs> and the kind of the red race continues. And also what happens when you are just the, you know, and this and this may go against some of the people, you know, what people believe in the fire movement, but the you should really focus on living today, on focusing you know, on focusing on the life you have today. And a lot of times when we set goals, kind of I wanna like I'm gonna not gonna enjoy life until I make five million dollars, and my life will begin when I'm gonna have five million dollars in the checking account or whatever. Well, the problem is you're only given so much life, right? And if you just and if you just if if all you do is just focusing on the future, you're really not inhaling, enjoying the present. That's one way to look at it. People, so I, my job. I'm a money manager, right? My job is to analyze companies, to build a portfolio of undeveloped companies, et cetera. So I like spend a lot of times, you know, like eight or 10 hours a day looking at dollars and cents, right? But to me, that's it's not about dollars and cents. It's just like the sculptor looks at this, you know, does not have to be in love with the stone when he makes a sculpture. I don't have to be in love with money when I invest. Money is just... It's just part of the it's just part of the game, like of analyzing companies, etc. It's just one of the variables. I would argue that money, when you don't have money, you a lot of your problem, you know, it's the source of a lot of your problems. When you have money, and we'll talk about what does it mean to have me in a second. When you have money, then it's actually could remove a lot of problems if you let it. And but a lot of people, what I find when they have uh, when they, when they have money, it just creates a new set of problems for them. 
what I mean by say when I say have, it's just basically, and there was a lot of studies that found that after you make a certain amount of money that where you, you know, pay for your basic expenses, then every, you know, the incremental dollar brings you a lot less happiness or removes a lot less pain. Um, but I tell you this, I've seen, I, I've met many people who would have hundreds of millions of dollars and are still upset about, obsessed about money as of a person who may has $10,000, okay? And I would argue that what money does really, it gives you options. Like, you know, it gives you options. It gives you freedom. But one thing I know for sure, that lack of money could bring unhappiness and stoics would have ways to do with that. But money by itself does not bring you happiness. Because there is a, such a thing as a hedonic adaptation, is that we get used to new things very quickly. It's like when you buy a new car and you have this jolt of, happen, of happiness, mm-hmm. and then a few months later, it just becomes an old car. So you began by mentioning Epictetus, who was one of the primary and first writers about Stoicism. As you're answering this question, I'm reminded of you talking about your father in the book. He was an academic, a professor. And I'm hearing that in your voice as you talk about stoicism. How did you get into wealth management? Like when you were in college, was this a path that you chose? True story. I wrote my first book in part because like there's many reasons why I wrote it, but one of them because I wanted my father to read it. Why did I want my father to read it? Well, my father has a PhD in electrical engineering. He's a true Renaissance man. Like it's you know, an intellectual Renaissance man. He's like my, he's my role model. And he always took what I'm doing as a, some kind of a version of a legalized gambling. He always looked <laughs> at the stock market as a, like, you know, as a, as a form of legalized gambling. And Actually, so the so I, I wrote my first book, Active Value Investing. It was 278 pages, 75 charts and tables. It was like a it was written for professionals like myself. And unfortunately, my father came to the United States when he was 58 years old. He was, so his English, even though he tried incredibly hard, was not good enough to read that book. When that book was translated into Russian, I actually the the Russian publisher asked. If I would edit the book, I said, sure, no problem. And they sent me the translated manuscript and I started reading it and I realized I understand every single word, but when I put them together, the meaning is kind of lost to me. So I took this opportunity to ask my father to edit the book. Remember, this is a person who never took an investment class or finance class in his life. And my father diligently edited this book. And we had this long discussions, you know, about this. And after my father read this book, he realized that yes, what I do is not a form of legalized gambling. And so that was a like that was a like one of the high points you know, in my life. <laughs> my father finally, because for a long time he was he was like he was telling me maybe I should open a bagel shop or something, do something, you know, do something that's productive for the society, not the investment thing. I was lucky that I fell into investing when I was relatively young. I think it was my 22 or 23 years old. And at that time, I was uh, second or third year, at school, maybe second year at CU Denver, and I was dating a lot of different majors. I, I, I did. I had, had a management. I had a marketing, some other uh, computer science. I was going to be a lawyer for about a day, and then I stumbled into. I took a finance class, and I happened to get a job at an investment firm. And they hired me not because I was good at the investment, etc. I was good with computers. And this combination of taking a finance class and working at an investment firm and talking to other portfolio managers at the firm, that made me realize that, my God, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So I was very lucky. And the good thing about this, when you realize this is what your passion is, now you can focus. Now you know, like I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I need to, to get my undergraduate degree in finance, graduate degree, get my CFA, which is Chartered Financial Analyst Designation. And that, you know, and, and after that, basically, that's how I got on this path. The book, Soul in the Game, is a varied book in which you talk about family, you talk about life, philosophy, as well as wealth. 
I'm going to do you slight disservice here because I'm going to focus on one part of the book, which is stoicism and how it relates to your life as well as to investing. One thing I found interesting is in the beginning of the chapters in which you talk about stoicism, you mentioned someone you call the stoic of Nebraska. And I'm wondering why you call him that, because that is not how the rest of the world sees him. <laughs> well, the, uh, Warren Buffett is usually referred to as Oracle Womaha. But I, you know, but I, but I, I, if you listen, you know, I've been going to Berkshire Hathaway annual meetings for the last 12 or 13 years. And if you listen to him, he actually, a lot of things he says are very stoic -y. You know, he, you know, he talks about having an internal and external scorecard. You and I talked about the Academy of Control. Well, that's, that's what, you know, it's internal scorecard. It's external scorecards are the same thing. Internal scorecard basically says when you make a decision, he puts it this way. Think about what if this decision, what if this act was published on the front page of a newspaper? Would you still be proud of this? Yeah, a lot of you know, there's a lot of things actually. I look at Warren Buffett, and I, I learned a lot about you know from him about investing, and also I learned about you know and I, and I I didn't realize it at the time, but this was my first you know, kind of one of my first introductions to stoicism through him. But I just <laughs> did not realize that I started writing the book. But also you know, but also like in the stoics, it's kind of interesting. Stoics. Talked a lot about you having your hero, your heroes, a person you're trying to emulate. But one thing I realized when you look at a hero, you realize that none of us are perfect. All of us, even your heroes, are not perfect. And when you look at your heroes, you want to see th things you want to emulate and things you don't want to emulate. So you want to have, even in your heroes, you want to have heroes and anti heroes inside of them. And so when I look at Warren Buffett, I luckily, when I was, when my kids were young, my, my, my son, I forget how, how old he was, but maybe seven or eight years old, I read this book, Snowball, about Warren Buffett. And this is the, the, the only authorized biography of Buffett, written by Alice Schroeder, which is, I don't know, 670 pages, you know, 600 or 700 pages. And it's a phenomenal book. But the most important lesson I got out of this book had nothing to do with investing. It had to do, it had to do what I did not want to become. I realized I did not want to become Warren Buffett in this regard. He had such a great burning passion for investing, then this passion basically burnt out other parts of his life. And he neglected his wife. And again, I'm not judging him. I'm just saying. I'm just you know kind of interpreting what I you know from what, what, what I read in the book, and and as importantly, he neglected his children. It's again his children were taken care of, etc. But he spent most of his you know most of his his time in his study where he f was looking to find another undervalued stock, and I realized I will never have Buffett's wealth, financial wealth, but and which is fine. But I don't want this part. I don't want to become like him in this regard. And that was very, very important to me. And I would argue that's probably one of the most important books I read from that perspective. I, I love the section in your book, which talks about just this, where you say that you should covet thy neighbor's wife, right? Yes. A take on the Ten Commandments. But what you're saying is that if we're going to covet what's good about them, we have to covet them as a whole. In this case, yes. with Warren Buffett. It's not only his financial pedigree and his abilities, but him as a real live man who did some things really well and other things not so well. I got to tell you a funny story. So the title, so this, that was an article that, that before it went into the book and the title was go ahead, covet your neighbor's wife. <laughs> okay. And I get this angry email from a guy. <laughs> he said, how dare you to write this? This is my 50th year anniversary today. And I get this email from you that, that says, I should go have it, you know, covet my neighbor's wife. And I'm like, maybe you should read beyond the subject, <laughs> beyond the subject line, because that was the opposite. The message was the opposite, obviously. So uh, that was the lesson that sometimes you probably, you, know, you want to go beyond this, you know, uh, the subject line. 
So let's talk about some misconceptions about Stoicism. There's this belief or the stereotype that Stoics are devoid of emotion. You say this isn't true. Yeah, go actually. I had this realization yesterday. I'm going to go Star Trek on you a little bit. Think about Vulcans in Star Trek, right? And I realized to some degree, Stoics, they are kind of the opposite of Vulcans. Like think about Vulcans, right? Spock, he had, he was very emotional, right? Inside of him, but he would not let these emotions come out using the willpower. And that to me is not what Stoics are. Stoics, basically what they try to do, they would try to look at this emotion, negative emotions, and try to switch them into in the neutral emotions, sometimes into positive, sometimes into neutral. And that is the Stoic superpower where what I'd say, it's not about not having emotions. It's about be able to manage them in a way that what could be a negative emotion turning into neutral or positive emotion. And uh, when we are born, think about this. And when we are born, we are not, it's not like we're given an instruction manual for life. Really, you know, our, the way we interact with life is, is kind of randomly written into our, our, our operating system by our parents, which is probably one of the most important contributions, but then by our friends. And if you're lucky and we have friends that came perfectly, like, you know, that help us to um, write in our operating system in the right way, we'll benefit from them, but could also go the other way. But then also through a lot of our just life experiences, I look at Stoicism as basically an operating system for life. It's a, almost like a curriculum that's not very, you know, I don't think it's you know, very structured per se, but it's a curriculum that allows you to look at life in a way that it minimizes negativity and also gives you some amount of purpose. When I learned stoicism, that was incredibly liber- liberating for me. You touched a little bit on this at the beginning of the episode. But I want to start really reaching into some of those central tenets of Stoicism and specifically how they apply to investing, because that's something that we're all here very interested in. Epictetus, who we mentioned before, said, the more we value things outside our control, the less control we have. Tell us about the dichotomy of control and specifically how would it play into, let's say, the feared recession that we're all worried about that's just around the corner? How can we use the dichotomy of control to better deal with kind of what may be coming in the future? I love this. That's such a great question. Let's talk about investing in general. So in investing, to be a successful investor, what you do has to be process-based. Like my process in a very high level is to identify high-quality companies, study them, see if I can understand them, then value them, and then buy them at the discount to what I think they're worth. And, and then have a portfolio of these companies. Not just one company, but we usually own 20, 25 stocks. What I do in the stock market, we approach the stock market, and this is what I'm talking to you about now, is kind of at the core of value investment principles. This is Warren Buffett would have told you the same thing much better than I would. But, you know, but so we look at companies, not as pieces of paper, but as businesses. Just, just because I'm buying it in the stock market does not mean I need to become this trading maniac that, you know, that basically mm-hmm. treats stock market as a casino. What I have control over is my process. You know, and I keep constantly keep working on improving this process, what I described. And I'm just, I'm giving the description at a very high level. Now, what I have zero control over is the outcome in the short run. None. I can buy a stock today and it suddenly discover it's down 20% tomorrow. And if I was right about that, it's a company that's worth a dollar, which I was buying for 50 cents. And now it's at whatever, 35 cents. I should be celebrating this because I can buy more of that. Okay. So, so I like what the, when a client comes to me, I tell them that what your portfolio is going to look like over the next six months or a year, what, what, the, you know, what the value of the portfolio is going to be, have zero control over that, none. And I have zero insight either. In fact, if, and this is, a, uh, let me give you some stock market insights. 
Nobody knows. <laughs> if when you go, when you listen, which people on CNBC or Bloomberg that give you predictions where the stock market is going to be in six months or a year, these people don't know. They just they just look very intelligent, very confident, and they tell you that, but they really don't know. Just wanted to know this. But now recessions are, and I'm not sure. I promise you, I'm not going to go too much into this. But recessions are a natural part of life and economy. Right? We need recessions because you know because when, during the expansions, we get things get loose. You know, we get too fat and too heavy. And recessions actually allow us to kind of go on this diet where we start looking at, you know, at our spending and say, well, maybe we have too much of this. Maybe we have too much of this. And that actually, it's that good because they, it's kind of cleansing for the economic system. Okay, I understand that people will lose jobs. And, and that's what happens during recessions. And, we have, you know, and, and, and I get that from a, from a human perspective. But overall, from economy, they're, they're good for the economy. Now, you... Stoics would say you probably need to have a negative visualization to realize when I'm buying a company, yes, recessions will come. And you should ask yourself a question, would I be comfortable owning this company during the recession? And if you are not, if you're not, maybe you should not be buying the stock, period. You should also be expecting that there will be stock volatility and the stock could decline 30%. Again, you can practice pre-negative visualization saying, okay, well, how, am I comfortable if I one day I discover this company is down 30%, the stock is down 30%? And if you are not, well, first of all, maybe you should not be doing investing, period. And maybe you have somebody do it for you. Or maybe you should not be buying that stock if you're not comfortable with that. So those would be, the key here is realize that where the price is, you know, when you wake up in the morning, is that stock market will have an opinion on mm-hmm. the stock price. And it's just an opinion. It's not a final verdict on the stock. And what you should be really focusing, not on those opinions, but on your process. So what you're saying is that there's a dichotomy of control. There's the things we can control, our process, the things we can't control, what's going to happen any given day in the stock market. It's easy to say that. But then when you're sitting there and looking at the stock market fall 30%, theory goes out the window. So when you're in that kind of judgment phase, how do we reframe? Because I think this is something that a lot of us can intellectually say, I agree with you, Vitaly, this makes total sense. On the other hand, when we're looking at our numbers, the day the stock market drops 30%, there's a huge urge to sell and get out before things get really bad, before the bloodbath happens. Even if we did all that process up front, how do we reframe the conversation in our head? Doc, this is such a great question. So a couple of things. Actually, I see this because I deal actually, you know, I, I, I manage money for investors. I see this all the time. And actually it's called empathy gap. Like clients would come to me and say, Vitaly, I just want the stock market to come, to drop. I'm looking forward to this. And I wish market just declined 30% tomorrow. And then the market is down 5% and they, you know, and they, and they're like, oh my God, what just happened? So, and it's not because they're lying to me. It's just, I think what we think, Think how we're going to react and how we actually react when things happen are just two different things. A couple of things. So, number one, as in, so the, I'll give you two answers to this. Okay. As in, so because there are two parties at this, you know, like, like from my perspective, person, me, who is making investment decisions, and then my clients who are, Whose money I'm making decisions, you know, you know about, you know, you, I mean, I'm basically, I'm using their money to make those decisions. Okay. Well, number one, I own the same stock my clients do. So in other words, all my liquid net worth is in the same stock. If I do, if I if I make a bad decision, it's not because I don't care. It's because that's what happens in the stock market. Now, here's the difference: for every company we buy. We do hundreds of hours of research. We build financial models with spreadsheets. We talk to management. We listen to earnings calls, all these different things. We do an incredible amount of research. So I understand this business very well. So when I when the stock price declines, I know that maybe this, you know, the, I thought the company is worth a dollar. I bought it at 50 cents, now it's 35. And I'm actually I'm celebrating. 
because actually company can buy its own stock or I can buy more of its stock. So this is from my perspective. Clients don't see that. So what they see is that I, I you know, they had a hundred thousand dollars, now they have 95 or whatever, or had a million, now they have less. My job is to bring them as close as possible to my analysis. And let me give you this, this analogy. I have a client. So, they, so I was talking to one of my clients and he used to be a pilot. And I told him how I'm afraid of flying. And let me explain what I mean by this. I fly a lot. Like, you know, I, I, you know, I, I fly a lot. But whenever I'm on the plane and the plane starts shaking, I become a little bit more religious. <laughs> Just a little bit more. And, and, and there is the academy here because on the intellectual level, I understand I should not, be, I should not worry about this. But, you know, but at the same time, emotions take over and I become nervous. It's kind of the same, you know, kind of, there's this empathy gap, right? Between what intellectually I should be thinking and what I actually think, okay? Now, so I told him about this. He said, well, it's kind of interesting. I, I'm retired and now when I fly, I am as afraid as you are. When I was a, when I was a, when I was a pilot, I was not, a, you know, when, when the turbulence happens, it didn't bother me because I was in control because I had all this information. I could see, I could see what's going on. And, you know, so now when I'm a passenger, it actually, I am, I am nervous. So my job as, as a portfolio manager is to bring my clients as close as possible into the cockpit without giving them the joystick or whatever the, the controls. So every, like four times a year, I write them letters there are as, sometimes as long as 30 pages long where I go through every major decision I make in their portfolio. And ex- I bought stack, stack A, here's why I bought it. I sold stack B, here's why I sold it. And what I find is that one of my jobs is to reduce volatility of my client's blood pressure. <laughs> okay. And that's, that's what these letters do. And you know, by the way, when the pandemic just hit, I went from writing like you know, four times a year to write in once a week for about a month, just because I was like, you know, I was not really prepared for this. I don't think anybody was. So I was sharing with them my thinking as, as I was, you know, like we were going through the storm and I was telling them how we're going to deal with that storm in real time. So anyway, so that's a, that is how I deal. You know, that's how I deal with it from a practical perspective. But also, my, so my job is to com- communicate to them, this is what this company is worth. Reframe it. I'm reframing it, basically. Don't look at the price only. Look at a relationship of the price to value. The value of the company doesn't change 50 times a day. It's, it, it rarely does. But the price does. So, and also, the other thing is, I wrote a lot of articles on the subject. Okay, a couple of advices. There's the, the most important advice I can give to your listeners is this. Don't look at your portfolio daily. But when you look at your portfolio value daily, all you do is you're experiencing the volatility and noise. You, you should be looking at your portfolio, especially when it's managed by somebody else, once a quarter on, in the most. Because the, throughout the day, you just experience the noise. And here's what happens. Let's say you had a million dollars and that million dollars de- declined to $900,000 and came back to, back to a million dollars. So you think you didn't lose anything. You did. Because here's what happens. The pain you experienced when it declined to $900,000 is a lot less than the joy you experienced when it came back. So you actually lost, psychologically, you actually, that pain was never upset the positive emotion you experienced by that gain. So, and when you own stocks, it's the feature, it's or the bug, or the fee. I think it's a feature, not the bug, that you're gonna have stocks going up and down. So every time the stock goes up and down, the pain causes you twice as much. You know, the negative decline, negative decline causes you several times more pain than appreciation when it goes back up. Even even if it makes you money in the long run, by you observing it on a daily basis, you're actually hurting yourself.
We are talking to Vitaly Katznelson. He joined Investment Management Associates in 1997, first as an analyst, then he became a portfolio manager, CIO, and today he's IMA's CEO and its biggest cheerleader. We're going to take a short break. I'm Doc G, and this is the Earn and Invest Podcast. Hey, everybody. This is Doc G. We are two weeks away from my book, Taking Stock, launching on Amazon August 2nd. We now have both a paperback version, a Kindle version, and Audible's version is coming out. It is now available for pre-order. Check it out. You can go to earnandinvest.com slash pre-orders. Again, that's earnandinvest.com slash pre-orders. And you can see both the Kindle version, the paperback version, and the Audible version. I hope you'll check it out. This really is a culmination of all we talk about here on the Earn and Invest podcast, as well as all the personal finance blogging and public speaking I've been doing for years. It's about what my hospice patients at the end of life have helped teach me about money and how we can live a regret-free life. I really hope you check it out and enjoy it. Now back to the show. Let me reintroduce you. We are talking to Vitaly Katznelson. He is the author of several books, including his most recent Soul in the Game, which champions the classic Stoic teachings both in life and investing. Vitaly, we were talking about some of the major Stoic principles. One is the dichotomy of control, and we talked about reframing. I want to move towards another one, which you briefly mentioned, negative visualization. Let me give you a lens to look at this at. Lately, I myself have been looking at my own book launch, and I've been working on positive visualization, this idea of seeing it be successful, seeing myself sell a million copies. You talk about negative visualization. Is it right that, especially at the beginning of your career, you would imagine yourself losing your biggest clients? And kind of ponder that, and that would help you forward as you started? (laughs) Such a great question. Yeah, so this is a true story. I don't know. This is my firm. This is uh, maybe 10 years ago. I forget when it was. But my firm was much, much smaller. And we had this large client. When he signed up, he basically told me everything I wanted to hear. In a sense, Vitaly, I'm buying into your philosophy. I'm a long-term investor. Like, just... Like he was like a perfect client. And then I don't know, I forget what it was, maybe a month, a month later, he starts asking us questions that are incredibly short term in nature. And I realized that this guy actually most likely there was we'll, we'll lose him. Today, actually, if he would like if you know, if you if you were at if if even if this happened today, I would probably have a direct conversation with him and say, maybe we're not the right fit for you. At the time, I just could not really afford to have this conversation. So I basically realized there is a very good chance for losing as a client, though I wasn't 100% certain about this. So what I basically I visualized as if you're going to lose them. And, and also, I adjusted my spending decisions you know, from a, budget, you know, a company's budget perspective as if we lost his revenue. If, you know, the, that revenue was gone from him. And he actually left three or four months later. And I tell you, when he left, I was actually kind of even a little bit more re- relieved because the uncertainty was gone. I'm like, okay. And a negative visualization, what it does, there's so many benefits from this. Number one, it reduces the volatility of negative emotions. But number number two, and this is a, I'm going to switch the focus lens of this a little bit. Sometimes it helps you to appreciate things in life that you wouldn't appreciate otherwise. Let me give you this example. I drive my kids to school. I my, my son is 21, so I don't drive him to school anymore, but I still have two daughters, 16 and eight. And I drive him to school almost every day. And when I do, in the past, I looked at it as a chore. But then, and this is a combination of two concepts now, reframing and negative visualization. Then I realized that I should be looking at it differently. I should be looking at it as a gift, as an incredible gift, because I'm given this incredible opportunity to spend time with my daughters. 
my 16 year old only has two years left. And there's probably, I don't know, what, 200 school days a year, or maybe a little bit more than that. I, I only have 400 days in the car, you know, 400 days that I'll be able to spend driving her to school over the next two years. And one thing it does, first of all, now I look at that with a smile and I look forward to driving them to school. But there is something else. When I'm in the car with them, I don't talk to my friends. I don't talk on the phone. I, we listen to the music together. We talk. And so my attention shifts to them. So I appreciate them more because I realize that's finite. And that is another benefit. You know, that's another benefit of this negative visualization because you start to appreciate things a lot more in life. You mentioned, and your story really reminds me of this in the book, a specific type of negative visualization called the last time. Talk about that a little bit and how it helps you appreciate things. Yeah, no, it's, I almost touched on this right now because you kind of last time, you realize anything you do in life, there will be time when it is the last time. I uh, met somebody who, a young woman who has a son who is a year old. And she asked me any advice you can give me as a young parent. And I said, yes, there's one advice. And I said, there's all going to be lost, like focus. Like when I was a, a young father, I always mentally wanted my kids to get to the next stage of their life. I'll give an example. When they were crawling, I wanted them to, uh, to walk. When they were walking, I wanted them to be self-sufficient, you know, et cetera. Like, you know, and not use diapers anymore. And then I realized that I should actually just enjoy them being who they are at this point in life, in, in time, because they will be the last time when they crawl and then start walking. And I'll be missing that. And so when you approach each day with a kind of with thinking that today may be the last time I'm doing something, I might as well enjoy it. I might enjoy, you know, kind of be there. That is so, so powerful. This idea of time and negative visualization, I think, wends its way throughout the Stoic literature. We've mentioned Epictetus, but I want to quote another major Stoic thought leader, Seneca. And let me read you this quote. What man can you show me who places any value on his time, who reckons the worth of each day, who understands that he is dying daily? For we are mistaken when we look forward to death. The major portion of death has already passed. Whatever years lie behind us are in death's hands. Let's talk about this knowledge of, of knowing that we're dying daily. Has that had an impact on your life? Yeah, I'm a 49-year-old dad. <laughs> <laughs> Stoics look at it slightly differently. Instead of saying, they basically look at the past. It's already behind us. There's nothing we can do about this. It's, you know, they, they want us to appreciate every minute of our life. In fact, Stoic, I mean, uh, Seneca has this concept, which I absolutely love, where he basically says, treat each day as if it was your life. Like, it's basically, like, imagine if you only have one day to leave, how would you do this? How would you treat other people? And suddenly, you're probably not going to spend this much time watching cat videos on Facebook. You'll be doing things that are more meaningful. And you're probably going to be, when you are sitting at the kitchen table, you're probably going to be looking at your cell phone. So try to have a perfect day. You know, and I think that each day a separate life is a, is, is a, like when I wake up in the morning, that's what I think about. How, how can I have the best day of my life today? It's a, Steve Jobs talk about it, how, you know, as much as I hate, I hate this, but the, you know, death is not a bug. It's the feature, it's the feature of life hmm. because, and I'm paraphrasing him because death, death makes us appreciate life so much more. When I came to, when I lived in Russia, I never had, I don't think I ever had Coke. Maybe I had Coke or Pepsi once, you know, when, when I lived in Russia, when I came to United States, and when I remember when I tried it once, Pepsi, it was Pepsi, how much I loved it. It was such a great taste. Then I came to the United States and I was shocked that you can buy kind of a gallon of, of Coke for like very little. And for the first year or two in the United States, I consumed Coke 
probably made up for the first lack of consumption for the previous 18 years. <laughs> and I remember, and I remember going to the restaurant where you could get unlimited refills. And I was on my third refill of Coke. And I realized I can't even taste the taste anymore. It just tasted like brown water. And because I drank so much of it, you know, you know that my taste buds kind of got numb. So this abundance, it's, you know, we, we look at the abundance as a great thing, but I would argue there is a downside to the, Biden, to the abundance because we don't appreciate things as much. So when I realized this, and I was, I was, I think maybe 21, 22 years old, very lucky. I basically started drinking Coke only on big occasions. When I, when I, when I go to a movie theater and I tell you this, now when I drink Coke, I probably drink it a few times a year. I appreciate every sip of that, of that Coke. The same thing about life, right? When you, when you think you have a limited amount of time, you're going to behave in a certain way. When you realize it's finite, everything is finite, you're going to treat it differently, more dearly. As you reframe this idea of time is finite, things are finite, sometimes abundance is not necessarily a good thing, but saving the Coke for that special occasion. I wanted to end by talking about something else, something else that maybe we try to limit, but has a big effect on our lives. And that's pain. Tell us about 2015. Tell us about going through the pain of that year for you and and how it maybe changed your ideas of of the importance of pain and, and how we should deal with it in our lives. You you saved the best for last. <laughs> so I let me so let me just tell you about this. So I wrote that chapter. I actually it wasn't it was it was not even a chapter, it was an essay in 2016 after I experienced the most excruciating professionally year of my life in 2015. And after I wrote it, I never I shared it with very few friends who I thought it could, you know, the chapter could help. But I did not have the guts to publish it because it was such a painful experience. And it was an extremely, if you read it, it's an extremely vulnerable, vulnerable, vulnerable chapter, right? It's a, I'm sure you could, you could feel the pain kind of on the pages. <laughs> for sure, for sure. So what happened was this. So I took over, the, you know, I started managing the company. So I've been a portfolio manager for a long time. And I started kind of became a CEO of the company in 2012. And at the time we were kind of a, the company was really not really managed much. It's a my partner Mike, his wife was sick. He was focusing on other parts of his life, but he was not really focusing on running the company. And when I became a CEO and I started managing the company, it took me a few years to turn the company from us shrinking to start to grow. And in 2015, we started to get a lot of new clients. We started to grow. And imagine this: you invest with us, and suddenly you wake up and realize you have less money. You have less money than you when you started. And, and it was a painful year because it's almost like usually uh, when you invest, you're gonna, always going to have a few stocks that don't work out. It's, it's just, it's almost like, a, or, or at that point in time, especially. That year, I had a, you know, I had a, we had a little bit more stocks that didn't work out. But more importantly, my, my portfolio was kind of not doing, like the, I didn't have anything to offset that. So we had, a, and then there was a, this tipping point where I was in Israel on a trip that was scheduled like maybe eight months before that with, you know, with my friends. And I had this one stock that basically declined by 70, 80% one day. And I forget the, you know, it wasn't a, such a great big position, but it was just almost like the last drop that kind of, it hurt, you know, it hurt. And I found myself incredibly depressed. And I, and I, I think at the time, you know, portfolio was down maybe 10, 15%, which is in the, kind of in the, in the, in the, on the grand scheme of things. When I look at it now, I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's kind of a normal volatility of a stock market. It's not like we declined 90%, right? It wasn't anything like that. It was a, we were down 10, 15%. But that was a, such a, like, I was, I was, I, I was, I remember I was so depressed because we went, <laughs> We're going through this to Israel. We were going to, we went to this party where everybody was. There was a lot of music. There was a lot of people were dancing, and they were so happy. And I was just, I realized how depressed people feel. 
Like, like it's this dichotomy where I feel so bad inside and there's so much happiness. And I look at these people and I, and I realize they don't realize how unhappy I am. Hmm. Anyway, so my point is this. Like after I went through this experience and 2016 ended up being a great year. So 2017 ended up being better. I, when I was looking at 2016, I realized when I was at 2016, looking at 2015, I realized I should be looking at this pain and this pain actually should be, we should try to capitalize on that because what pain does, it makes you, it, fo- it, it focuses you and, you know, it focuses you to see how you can improve. And that's, and that's exactly, if you do it right, that's what you should be doing. You say, okay, this is what happened. How can I improve? And in 2016, I looked at what, you know, at my decisions I made in 2014 and 2013 and 2015, because usually what, what happens is that when you make bad decisions, they don't manifest right away. Like you may feel it. I might, I might've felt in 2015, but that, those were not necessarily the decisions I made in 2015. Those are the purchase decisions I made in 2014 and 2013. And I went back and re-examined my decisions. And I found that I, you know, some of the things that happened to me, there was just randomness. Well, you know, there was just, they, the stock prices declined. And for actually, most of them like, came back and made us money. The one stock that actually declined 80%, that stock actually never came back. And I realized I made an analytical mistake when I was analyzing it. And I learned from that and modified our investment process to make sure we don't make that mistake or that type of mistake. And since then, I haven't made that mistake. This is, you know, seven years later, I haven't made that type of mistake, which saved me from a lot of pain that could have been experiencing today. So we should be looking today at pain and not just try to dismiss it to see if you can learn from it. Some, and sometimes, not all the time, you can learn from it. If you are involved, in, and this is, this is what Stoics would tell you, if you are involved in any creative activity, the pain is part of it, okay? If, if there is no, because what any creativity comes with pain because you, when you start, you don't know what the finish is going to look like. You don't know what the final product is going to look like. And, and that difference between where you are and where you're going to be, there is a lot of uncertainty and you try and you fail. By the way, WD forty actually I was just you know just you know WD forty, which you know, it's it's called WD forty because that's was his fourth fortieth trial. <laughs> yeah, okay, he failed thirty nine times before he got to the, the formula. So any creative activity is going to have a certain amount of pain, and you should be expecting that. Now the question is, is this a pain meaningful to you? Like if you, it's you know, it's, in other words. In life, happiness really comes from having good problems. If you don't have good problems, you're going to have very kind of uninteresting, boring life. And a lot of good problems, you know, the, when, you, like when, you, you, when you walk and you see a guy, there's construction going on, and you see a guy standing with a stop and go sign, when that, guy, you know, that guy has very little creative pain when he's standing there with that sign, stop and go, because there's very little uncertainty of what he has to do. When you deal with anything creative, pain will be part of it, and you should expect that. Stoics have this whole list menu of things you can do to deal with pain. Number one, you should you should use a negative visualization ahead of time to you know to be prepared for this. So in other words, right now when we are doing actually fairly, relatively well, I should be looking forward towards you know the end of the year or whatever next year, expecting that my portfolio will be down thirty percent. Okay. That's, you know, that's, I should be also looking in the proper context and the proper context in 26, it's kind of interesting. If I look at 2015 and I combine, combine the returns of 2015 with 2014, we still had a, over two years, we still had two good years. You know, if, if I, you know, and if I looked and combined 2015 with 2016, we still had, you know, two good years as well. But also, and Stoics, Marcus Aurelius, uh, which is another Stoic, who was the emperor of Rome, he talked about whenever you have problems, you don't want to you don't want to amplify them by using a lot of fancy words. You want to kind of break them down to the basics. 
Okay, let me give an example. When you go to a restaurant, and Americans are great at this, they're going to tell you that, you know, the server will tell you, would you like this, you know, Atla- Alaskan salmon with a honey glazed and a basil from France or whatever. It's going to be very, very fancy name, right? Marcus Aurelius would say, like, if, you know, would you like a dead fish with some, you know, with some herbs, okay? Mm-hmm. And the, the point is this, a lot of times we actually amplify things that don't need to be amplified. What, what I've, instead of trying to say how much I screwed up in 2015, I should have said, well, we have one stock down 80%, three stocks down, whatever that was, 30%. Our portfolio is down this much. And I should, list, I should have looked at every single stock and said, okay, this stock, I don't think it's going to come back. These two stocks, they don't have any problems. The stock price declined. And if you approach it this way, then suddenly this, first of all, the amount of pain you have is actually going to decline because a lot of it is artificially created in, in, a, in our mind. And also what's going to happen is that you're going to become a lot more objective. And I think that's, so one thing actually did help me at that point, like that day when I was like at the, at the bottom of it, I sat down and wrote a letter to my clients. When I write, I'm a lot more rational than when I, when I, when I spent, you know, when I'm in my, in my own head. And writing this letter, I basically talked to my clients exactly what happened. And after I was done with that, I actually, the amount of pain I, I felt maybe declined by 50%, which was a huge, which was huge. The book is Soul in the Game. I've not done it complete justice. We've talked about one section, which is stoicism, but there is a lot about money, life, classical music composers, you name it. There's a lot of great info there. I wanted to end this episode the way I end every episode by asking you first, what is going on in your life? Specifically, where can people get Soul in the Game if they're interested? And next, if they want to ask you questions, how can they reach out to you? So tell us about the easiest way to get Soul in the Game into their hands. Well, they can buy it in any online bookstore. But what I would suggest they do, go to soulinthegame.net. And there they'll find instructions how where they can buy the book, which is fine. But more importantly, they'll get instructions how they can get four new chapters I wrote after the book came out. So, you know, if, you know, and I, so you, because one thing I realized when I finished writing the book, the only way I could finish writing the book by telling myself that this is just volume one. So there, you know, so I, I keep, you know, so, so I had to trick myself to finish the book by telling myself that I'm going to keep writing. And I have. So you can, if you go to soulinthegame.net, you'll be able to get my future chapters as well for free, absolutely free. They can contact me. And after you read the book, send me your questions. And as, as, I, as, uh, as I told you in the beginning of this conversation, I look at my life as kind of, as now as a writing prompts. When you send me questions after you read the book, it actually makes me, it makes me think about new topics and write about them. So, I'm, and, and, and which, I, which I absolutely love. So uh, send me your questions. So again, go to soulinagame.net and get the book. This has been the Earn and Invest podcast. On behalf of myself, Doc G, I'd like to thank Vitaly Katznelson. That's a wrap. Awesome. All right. So I leave the recording going just for a few minutes while we chat, just as like an after show, if anything comes up, yeah, we're yeah, putting up there. Yeah. So was there anything that, so clearly I couldn't have covered the whole book, right? Because there's no, a lot, no, no, there's no, a lot there. Book. Is there anything at least about what we did talk about that you feel like we missed or didn't talk about? Can, I, I got to tell you the story. When I, when I realized I'm wealthy and it's <laughs> not, it's not as bad as it Go ahead. Go ahead. Not as bad as it sounds. Uh, I remember like early 2000s, you know, I'm still early in my career. And I read about this guy, his name is Bill Gross. He's kind of, he's the banking, you know, he runs the PIMCO at the time. Mm-hmm. And there was this huge profile in one of the magazines, I forget it, Fortune or Forbes. 
and they write about his daily habits. And one of the things you know they say he does, he eats blueberries every day, <laughs> fresh blueberries every day. And I actually happen to like blueberries. And and they explain you know, all the un- antioxidants and how it helps your memory, etc. And I was and I, and the time I was thinking, I wish I could afford to eat fresh fresh blueberries every day. I couldn't. The t- at the time we, we couldn't. Or if we did, I would have to give up something else, which I didn't. I wasn't willing to give up. And then, and then I got to the point where actually I could go to grocery store and buy blueberries and not look at the price. And that's when I felt wealthy. In fact, every time I buy blueberries now, when my wife sends me shopping, I always buy blueberries. And every single time, it gives me this little jolt of happiness. Uh-huh. By the way, just you know, so I don't sound like a complete jerk it's the blueberries cost as much as a starbucks fancy drink so it's a but that's a to me that actually buying blueberries gave me gave me meaning and gave me some satisfaction so um that's a that's uh uh anyway so that's a that's that's how that's and i and i think the 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 i think the punchline is that the little things in life Mm-hmm. can really bring us a lot of happiness. We just have to be mindful about that. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think that um, we spend a lot of time, we as in the, the greater we, spend yeah. a lot of time focusing on money because we think it'll make us happy. And clearly it doesn't. The Stoics knew it. You know it. I know it. It's more that there are certain luxuries in life, specifically pursuing things that are important to us, or sometimes it is those little material or consumption things that have real meaning for us. It's, it's being able to take advantage of those that, that matters. And I think we forget that, like we forget to, to understand that place that money plays in our life, um, which still allows us to be a good steward of money and to be a good investor and to do all those things. But it's, it means much more when that, when what we're creating is going towards something that is deeper value to us. I think money gives you You get the most highest return on your money when you buy things that you value the most. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think it's very important for us to figure out exactly what we value. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I and I it's a we have to be mindful about this. Like, like if I like in my future chapters I write about mindfulness. Yeah, yeah, because I don't think I, I've done. I work. I, I spent some time working on this, on, on writing about this in the book, but I don't think I've done it justice. And I think the, like a lot of financial advice, like, uh, like I would give my kids, is actually look at all your spending, and because a lot of it just happened in a random way. Just you, you know, you spend money because you spend money, and and evaluate it and mind uh, and be mindful about categorizing things you actually value mm-hmm. and those things when you spend money on them uh they should come at the expense of things that you value the list 